This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. Click the Fight TV link on WrestlingMayhemShow.com to support this show and watch pro wrestling, MMA, boxing, and so much more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash WrestlingMayhemShow. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron in on the Twitter here in the Mayhem Studio in Pittsburgh, PA, where we talk with a lot of people in and around the wrestling industry. We got a we got a, a great one here today. A returning guest. We'll get into that in a moment. But uh, in the meantime, please check out the show. Please subscribe to us, Indie Mayhem Show, on the iTunes, Stitcher, Speaker, iHeartRadio, and video versions available on the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook and YouTube page. Join the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook group. Drop us a line at goodtimes at wrestlingmayhemshow.com or 412-206-WMS0. Uh, any thoughts you have on a, a guest that we maybe have announced, uh, questions for them, or even if there's anybody you think we should be uh, uh, checking out and having on the show, uh, this one, actually, this one was by some demand to get him back on. Uh, so uh, it, it, we definitely listen to you guys and at least attempt to. Uh, so I'm going to give you a laundry list one time of about eight girls in wrestling, and we got about half of them earlier in the year. Like, we, we really do look out for that because we don't see all the wrestling out there and and, and, and kind of miss the the people sometimes right under our noses uh and also please uh support the show we're over at patreon.com slash wrestling mayhem show uh, a lot of guys uh supporting the show there uh thank you so much for that you're helping the mayhem world go round and you don't have to throw money at that you can also uh just share the show uh wherever you like anybody you think is going to be into these kinds of wrestling conversations or any of the other shows we have going over on on uh, uh, WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Uh, this week, we have a returning guest, as I mentioned. Uh, we had him on uh, a, a while ago, around, uh, I think, just after Tough Enough. And, uh, and, and, and he was just beginning a new venture. And it sounds like a lot of it might be coming to a culmination here uh, very, very soon. Give it up one time. J-Rock Daddy is back on the show. How you doing, sir? Oh, I'm fantastic. How you guys doing here tonight? All right, all right. So, like we said, when we talked to you, you were uh, kind of recap for the people who maybe didn't catch that show because it was about I don't know about a hundred episodes ago that we did that. Um, you were kind of making a comeback into the wrestling, kind of you were refocused, and you had a lot of uh, kind of new stuff going on. Can, can, can you touch base on kind of where you were at that point? Yeah, man, I remember that. That was got to be about two years ago or something close to that, and. Uh... Yeah, it was about two and a half years ago, maybe three, when I started uh, getting back into wrestling. I had gotten away from it for a few years and gotten into my radio career and, you know, whatever. Uh, all the things that happen in life and uh, it goes different ways that you don't expect. And then I had started coming back and the, the last two years or so, um, like my personal situation changed. Everything changed. This is actually the first time in my life. I've had so many people, you know, who have seen some of the stuff I've done, whatever, over the last couple of years here and said, man, you know, what happened back then? And it's like, well, what happened is life happened. And this is like the first time ever in the entire 19 years coming up next month that I've been wrestling that I've ever just been able to wrestle. I mean, just all in as the expression goes. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how else to explain it other than clearly it's been working thus far still got a ton of things to do i mean i i was saying I, I posted something earlier today everybody sees all the progress i just see all the things i still have left to do and and um but i am definitely it's progressed a lot in the last couple of years and uh, a whole lot of great opportunities and it feels really feels really different even this time around than the first time i got to do a lot of this stuff because I've been there and then I've I've left and I've been out of wrestling and I've done all kinds of other things and then to get to do it again uh, you you have a lot more fun with it and you appreciate it a whole lot more Absolutely. That's amazing. I didn't know you were at that point because I know there's that. It is interesting because there is that threshold, right? Of, you know, is the wrestling the number one job, right? Uh, for, especially oh, yeah. guys on this level. Um, can you talk a little bit about that trans transition? Because I don't think we've had a good conversation about that before. Oh, man. I mean, you know, the realities of my life. I mean, my career, there's all kinds of things that um, guys can take guys half my age breaking in the business can take from it good and bad. And I, I've got like a lot of examples of all of that throughout my life. I mean, I've made the classic missteps and, and done some of the good things that, um, 
you know, like my son, my son's getting ready to, to start training here in the next couple of weeks. He's been in the gym with me for the last few months, getting ready for that. He had just turned 18 and, you know, so he's going to have the benefit of all my hindsight from all the things I went through. But, you know, wrestling is very hard on a marriage and I was married for most of my wrestling career since I was, I, I mean, I was with, uh, my former wife, my entire adult life, which is also the same amount of time I was wrestling. And let me just tell you that the two of those don't uh, always go together. And, and it is what it is. It's a tough thing on both sides. It's very whatever and real life. And, you know, you get to, you get to 25, you get to 30, all of a sudden you've been doing it 10 years and people are like, Hey man, you know, you've got kids, you've got responsibilities, you've got, you know, whatever. And I started getting into the radio thing anyway, as a backup for whenever I was done wrestling, because radio fit a lot of the skill set that I had. I went to broadcasting school and I kind of got funneled in that direction. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was able to fend off all of the, the, the in-laws, the parents, the grandparents, all of the different people who were telling you, you know, quit chasing the dream, quit doing all that stuff. It's time to start getting serious. You've got to get ready for this and that and the other thing. And it's easy. You can fight them off for a while. But then, you know, when the radio station comes calling with amounts of money that become very difficult for you to justify not committing yourself to, all of a sudden, it becomes a lot harder to fight that battle. And on top of that, you get 10, 12 years in and you still haven't broke through and you start to, you know, like I told you before, you get bitter, you get better. And I most definitely crossed that line to where I, here's the way I tell like people now is uh, for the longest time, I thought that the wrestling business was, it was like a line. There's a line to get in the front door of quote unquote, making it. And you get in line when it's your, when you break in the business and wherever your place is in line, there's a bunch of wrestlers in front of you and a bunch of wrestlers end up behind you and you work your way through. And it's like, it's like any other thing in life. You work and you pay your dues long enough and eventually you, you make it to the front door and it's your turn to go in. And what you don't realize is that's not the way it works. I mean, in a perfect world, that would be great. But meantime, while while people are waiting in line for their quote unquote turn for it to be their time, the guys that are hungrier, the guys that don't care whose time it is, will do whatever it takes to jump past you. And and an opportunity only knocks a certain amount of times and you have to be ready for it. And so, you know, uh, uh, long story short, that all of those things played a part into it. And I got completely out of it. And then while I was out of it, I mean, you know, I was never uh, jacked, so to say, and in, in the best shape, but I was always in decent shape and great cardio for wrestling, no matter what my physical condition was, but it was nothing like it should have been at the time. And then I blumped up to, if anybody's seen me on the Jake, the snake documentary that's out there. I mean, I was up to 325 pounds. I mean, I was, another person. And I was miserable because of everything, because of the personal stuff, because of the injury stuff. I had suffered some concussions. And I mean, there was a whole bunch of reasons why I quit wrestling. It wasn't any one particular thing. And it was driving me crazy because I loved wrestling. Wrestling was all I had ever wanted to do since I was a kid. And I had come so close in my mind and then it had it like taken away and like life just sucked for a while. You know, I mean, people, you get there and, and then eventually things just changed. And I, I just changed my mindset on a lot of things in life that had nothing to do with wrestling. And one of the things that came along with that, as I started getting into shape and I got also some friends had kind of come over and I had to really stay away from wrestlers because Tracy Smothers used to teach me during his little mini retirements that he would have that the only way you could successfully do that is to not talk to anybody in the wrestling business because the minute you start talking to them they're going to start sucking you back in just because you're going to get bit by the bug again you know and and he was absolutely right because the minute Matt Roby and Matt Justice and a couple of guys started talking to me about coming back or doing something and me being a part of it, boom, I'm instantly starting to think about it. But I was huge and out of shape when I came back. So it took me the whole first year of my comeback just to get to, I shed 125 pounds. I shed about a hundred in the first year of my comeback. And then I've dropped, you know, another 30 or 40 over the course of the next year since then. But I got on the DDP yoga when I went down and did the, uh, Jake the Snake movie. And I mean, I changed my whole life, changed my lifestyle. I mean, while I was out of wrestling, I used to smoke cigarettes. I was ridiculous. I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 15 years. You know, seven years ago, I quit cold turkey. So I had made so many positive changes in my lifestyle. And then coming back to wrestling was like the next thing. And then, you know, it just everything kind of seemed to come together for a reason. And, um, 
so regardless of what was happening in my marriage and my personal life and all of that at the time, everything kept funneling back towards coming back to wrestling. And then, you know, one thing after another just kept building momentum. Like I said, the whole first year of my comeback was just getting back into shape and picking up a show. And like, I was happy, not happy, but I was lucky if I was working a show or two a month when I first came back. And, and then even the second year I was getting so frustrated because it just felt like, um, it felt like, like every month, every, whatever matches I was having, the next one was always better than the last one. And and that's the way it's supposed to be. And like, and, and it felt like we were stuck, like not really getting, you know, well, why, you know, this guy works this much, that guy work, what are we doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And, you know, Bob Evans, who I'm sure a lot of your listeners know from ring of honor, brutal Bob Evans. Um, he's a guy I credit a lot to helping me change my mindset when I came back into wrestling the second time around, because nobody does something the second time exactly the same. If you do, you're an idiot because there were obviously reasons. doesn't matter if there's a thousand good things. There's obviously reasons that were wrong or not correctly done that you didn't get attain the success that you hope to get or get as far as you wanted to get. So if you're going to come back, if you're going to do all the work, and this is what I told myself, if you're going to do all of that stuff to come back, you have to change the way you do it. You have to change everything about it. And Bob is really great. I tell every young wrestler out there, if you don't follow Bob Evans on Facebook, you're ridiculous because just listening to the stuff he says, if you change your mindset on how to get out there, how to look at the business, how to focus, just focus differently on what success is and how to achieve it. It really does work. And, and a lot of that played a part in changing my whole mindset when I came back, man. And then, like I said, one thing after another, it really started to build momentum. And now, I mean, not only physically am I in the best shape I've ever been in, but my career is in the best shape I've ever been in uh, 19 years in, which is absolutely ridiculous. Like I've never been as busy and out there and doing as many different things as I am now, which is nuts. It's, it's really been really inter- interesting to watch. And, and, you know, we mentioned, you know, we, we've been talking about online, you know, you doing this match with uh, Jason Gory at RWA uh, last month. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, for me, it, it's a great uh, kind of uh, uh, callback because when I first started going to indie shows, it was you and Jason Gory along with, Shima Zion and Ray Rowe and these great tag team matches. It was a great, nice comeback. But but seeing um, kind of the, you know, between seeing what you're doing at RWA uh, and seeing you pop up a lot of places, right? Uh, you know, the Ring of Honor thing. I, not knowing you were in the Jake Roberts movie, for instance, about the very thing that I think we talked about on the show the first time we had you on about the incident in Cleveland. Um, <laughs> but it was great to see, like, that... Because I remember you being on the show and how how mad you were and, and and everything, and to see that kind of coming around in a very positive way, uh, well, at least that was my thoughts when I was viewing that documentary and seeing you as a part of it. Well, you know, I don't, here's something for people that saw the documentary, and I don't think I've ever told this story to anybody except a few the people that were there and stuff. Maybe I told I don't know if I told you guys before, but. Um, Matt Justice had ran a series of shows uh, throughout the Midwest here that uh, ARW. I was talking to you guys about it before, but yeah. I don't think I've talked to you guys since then. Yeah. Well, I I had a second go around with Jake Roberts. This was actually kind of amazing, and it, it's right off of that. So uh, Matt Justice had Jake Roberts booked for shows. I think they were in like James or Johnstown, Pennsylvania, at, at the War Memorial, and. Um, Washington, Pennsylvania at that baseball stadium they've got. So the first night Jake was there and uh, Matt Justice had like me and Matt Roby helping run the locker room because he was doing all the promoter stuff all night. And Jake like was there in the beginning of that. And I have not seen Jake at this point because he was not there when I went down and filmed the stuff for the movie. He was supposed to be there because they wanted us to do something, but he ended up not being there. So I had not seen Jake since the thing happened in Cleveland whenever whenever that was 10 years ago or whatever. And, uh, so, uh, the first night Jake was at his gimmick table and he was kind of out of it and it wasn't a good sign. Like it looked like, Oh man, is it really? Cause you know, he's had rehabs before that didn't take, uh, I mean, it's, he's been open about that. So you're going, man, I hope this isn't going to be the same thing. Cause we had him working later in the night. I think he was I don't remember what he was doing, but he ended up in a six man. Tommy Dreamer really wanted him to be in this match. So we did a six man and he was Tommy Dreamer's mystery partner. And he really didn't do, wasn't able to do much. He did like one thing at the end, the DDT. And it was, 
he was really out of it. And we were, we weren't sure if it was because he was doing other stuff, but, uh, the next day it was a completely different story. And then it turned out that it, he had been jet lagged from the flight. He had a late flight in and that was what had happened the night before. He was just really tired. But so the next day we're thinking, okay, man, what's going to happen with Jake? And he hadn't seen me the whole night before. So we got to the building and as soon as I walked in, Jake and his daughter, who was on the road with him, were already in the locker room at that baseball stadium there. So I walked in and I was on the complete other end of the locker room and his daughter goes, you come here for a minute. And so I walked down there. I knew right then and there that, that obviously they realized that I was the guy. And um, she goes, we know who you are. And I laughed. I said, oh, who am I? And she goes, you're the guy from the movie. And I said, yeah, that's me for sure. And it, it wasn't a hostile thing at all. Her and Jake right away, Jake stood up and he wanted, he apologized, stuck his hand out. He said, it wasn't my best day. And, uh, uh, cause I told him that I had regretted everything that happened that day too. I, I've said that publicly before. And, um, and so anyways, we had a big, long talk, the whole thing, blah, 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 all day long. He was super congenial about everything. So was his daughter. I mean, he was as lucid as can be. I mean, he really had no issues at all. Then all he was supposed to do that night was an autograph signing. He told, he literally volunteered to work a tag match that night with uh, uh, Lumberjack against me and Matt Roby. And then we thought, okay, well, he was just going to do like the simple come in at the end, do one thing or whatever, like he did the night before. And he goes, no, I want to work with J-Rock a little bit. I don't know if it was because of just making up for what had happened before or what, but him and I went out there and actually did a little bit of stuff. It wasn't a whole lot, but it was a lot more than Matt Justice come up to me afterwards and goes, dude, what did you do to get him to do all that stuff? And I'm like, I don't know. He just wanted to, but it was really cool. So it was like a whole closure thing and coming full circle and Everything was real cool, man. So uh, there's no issue with me and him at all. But that was nuts. They were like, yeah, we know who you are. And and then he just sat there and talked to me and apologized for it and everything. And, you know, he came clean. He felt bad about the whole cold drink thing and accusing us of, of doping his drink and all that stuff. And so it was a cool deal. And we got a great shot here of, of the match on YouTube. You guys can find it uh, of him. Uh, um, um uh, giving you the old uh, test of strength here. So, <laughs> oh yeah, right. It's on my YouTube, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. So uh, you can you can check that out. Exactly what we're talking about. Both matches uh, I, I did uh, find over there too. So you can see uh, exactly that sequence of events, at least in the ring. I mean, he was you know he was mm -hmm. really up for doing a few things. It was mm -hmm. it was all right, man. Yeah, and I remember. I mean, you know, I've seen him. You know, probably not in the greatest days. Uh, at IWC, you know, uh, some of the Clearfield shows or, or, or uh, you know, Newville or whatever. And yeah, he didn't, he didn't never really look too great or did much of anything. So it's, it's good to see him in there. Um, so I, I remember WrestleCon one year seeing him jogging up and down the aisles and, and being in good shape and good spirits. So it's, it's good. To, it's great to see a, a happy ending to a story like that. So yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, I think I saw an article with Scott Hall is like in, in like some of the best shape of his life right now. So I saw that too. doing real good. It's like awesome, you know. Hey, I gotta be one of those guys too. DP yoga changed my life. That Absolutely. stuff works. I tell everybody that stuff is legit. It took ten years off of my career. I'm telling you, it rewound the clock. People keep saying, I mean, obviously getting in shape was great and all that stuff, but like not just that. That DDP yoga did a ton in the first year to get me back. I mean, to where I'm working, like I, it loosened everything up. It broke everything up. My hips, my joints. It, it does everything. It's made by a wrestler for wrestlers for a reason absolutely I, I i've had my hand at it too and it really it really kicks your ass too yeah so you, you don't think about that with yoga um but not to be a yoga ad but uh <laughs> but but it's seriously it's worse for a lot of people um tell me a little bit about you know uh, you mentioned here in passing a little bit about uh you know you you did uh have some you know obviously talking with brutal bob evans and uh you popped up in a future of honor match recently uh that that i've seen uh going around on, on ring of honor's youtube page can you talk about a little bit of uh getting that opportunity and, and what's been going on there yeah, I've uh, been really blessed to have a, a lot of opportunities come in my way and, and a few more still to come. Um, the Ring of Honor thing, I'll tell you what, here's a story for young guys if they're out there listening, and I'm sure there's some that do from up there around Pittsburgh and stuff, um, about chasing down your opportunity. Um, I got in, I'll tell you, it's funny, because I trained Shane Taylor. Shane Taylor is a contracted Ring of Honor wrestler. Ray Rowe is one of my best friends. He's obviously one of the biggest stars in Ring of Honor and New Japan and all that. And, um, 
So you would think, man, it's just like, hey, can I can I come get a tryout? Hey, put in a word for it. That's not how it works. And people don't understand that when they're first breaking in the business or people people really don't understand how it works. Like, yeah, when you have people that are somewhere, once you get an opportunity, it's great to have as many voices as possible to say, hey, man, you know, that's my dude. He's pretty good. But if anything, a lot of cases it hurts you because of that very perception and them wanting to avoid that, you know? And Ray told me from the get-go when I started coming back, when I started getting really serious, uh, Ring of Honor was something that I had never been interested in my first go around in wrestling because it was, first off, it wasn't the Ring of Honor that it is now. It was that super crazy athletic style, you know, really high spotty. And I was really against that. It wasn't my bag. I wasn't what I did. And so that was never a goal of mine, never even something I tried. I never even never barked up that tree once in the first 10, 12 years before I uh, hung it up for a couple years. But this time when I started getting in shape and, you know, I, I just, I really felt different. And I don't know how to explain that. Like, I guess athletes, other wrestlers would know or whatever, like in the ring, like it just felt different when I came back. Maybe it's because of all the years of knowing all the stuff I've done and all that experience. And then really putting it together physically but like like I said, every match it felt like it was getting stronger and stronger and, and it just I don't know I started and then obviously seeing Shane there seeing Ray there I mean I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with those guys my entire career you know and and EC3 is is this franchise of freaking TNA and I mean I remember the day he walked in my gym and asked me to teach him how to be a pro wrestler you know so and and that's and those guys are awesome and I, and I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and I don't mean that in a bad way it just got me thinking you know what if you're gonna do it we're not doing this to come back and wrestle on Saturdays. You know what I mean? Let's take one more run at this before the numbers in my age really do get too big. And so I said, Ray, what do I got to do? And he straight up told me, he said, everybody has to go through the camps. Once you get uh, through that and they give you the thumbs up, then it's a different story. You're on your own. And then, the, you know, that's how the ball starts rolling. He said, everybody that's not an international star or, or a name that had just come out of, you know, WWE or something like that, that is how you get in. And so, you know, the minute Ray told me that, I said, okay, fine. Then that's what I got to do. First, let me come talk to Hunter or talk to Delirious. And, you know, obviously you've been around. We used to run in the IWC days together, you yep. know, when him and him and Daisy were in all the time. And, and, and we had a lot of similar habits and we hung out together a lot. So, um, and I hadn't seen him for years. And like when Ray started doing, he caught that one Ring of Honor show in 2013 or whatever it was down in Texas. Delirious literally said, Ray Rowe, I thought you disappeared. Like he literally he had lost track of him because Ray disappeared for a while. And it was the same thing. I went down to Columbus last summer when they had a house show in Columbus and I was backstage all night and I waited and uh, Hunter said, hey, man, I'll make time for you. Don't worry. We'll talk at the end of the night. And I did. I went there. I helped him. I mean, I put up the ring. I helped out. I did everything, they, anything they asked me to do. I was there about 13, 14 hours and uh, then I got five minutes to talk to Delirious before he headed out for the night. And I said, hey, bro, I'm, I'm serious about this. You see my come, you know, and he had already known he had he had been plugged about my comeback. And he was real impressed with, you know, how I got myself back in shape and everything. And he said, come to the camp. You don't got to pay for it. Nothing like that. You're invited. You're my guest. Come to the camp. Matter of fact, I couldn't even come on the Saturday because I had a show. He said, I don't care. Just come on Sunday. I need you to come and show them what I already know. I said, all right, man, thanks for having the confidence in me. So I wrestled uh, the Saturday before the camp. I was in like Erie, drove by myself all through the night to get to Philly. It was like seven hours or something like that. Got to the dojo at about eight o'clock in the morning, slept until 10 when the, uh, when the thing started, went in there and spent the day cutting promos and wrestling in front of the booking committee at Ring of Honor. And then when the, when the end of the day came, uh, out of like 40 guys there, and, and I know a lot of guys that you've had on this show, like LaRusso and them have gone through it too, so they know what I'm talking about. Uh, everybody has a match, and then the booking committee basically tells you whether they feel you're ready for TV or not, and if you're not, what you what you need to work on and all that stuff. And um, I got unanimous thumbs up, uh, mostly because of my character and my talking ability, but uh, everybody said, hey man, we could put you on TV right now. And I got some really high compliments while I was there. And, uh, and I'm not going to lie. I wasn't sure that was going to happen. I had faith in myself, but having that level of faith is something different because I mean, the only other guys that I actually did that with uh, the fraternity was at that one. 
Uh, that was the one where they got the thumbs up. Sunny Kiss was there, who I think is amazing, and I can't believe more people have not gotten on the Sunny Kiss train yet. And um, uh, the Left Coast Gorillas. Um, everybody, uh, everybody else, it was you know close, but you got to work on this, got to work on that. And uh, even me, I mean, Kevin Kelly said, "Hey, before we, in the meantime, before we find something, you know, an opportunity for you, work on this." They didn't like my gear. They didn't like the singlet. They didn't like. Uh, it wasn't that they didn't like, it was just they wanted me to keep working on things. And I said, okay, no problem. So that's why you've seen me evolve my look, evolve my tights, evolve all of that stuff. Because I've been really trying to, pretty much everything that they told me to work on, every time they've seen me since I've worked on it. I mean, that's what you've got to do. But so I went Cleveland to Columbus so that I could go back to Cleveland to get ready to drive up to Philly to do the tryout. Then I went back home to Cleveland after that two-day weekend of driving by myself. I was a zombie. I nearly crashed by the time I got back to Cleveland at five in the morning. And then they told me, hey, we'll find an opportunity for you. Just stay in touch, blah, blah, blah. Didn't hear nothing for about two months. So I went to a house show in Pittsburgh. Hunter's like, oh man, dude, if I'd have known you were going to be here, I would have gave you a shot tonight. Come to Lockport tomorrow. I'll put you on the show. Came to Lockport the next day. So I went Cleveland to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Lockport. Kevin Kelly walked up to me and said, J. Ryan, you walked up to me and Hunter and said, if we gave you one minute on the mic, that's all you need to show us you're ready for TV. You got your shot. Go out there and cut a promo. And they sent me out there and had me cut a promo with some guys and came back to the back and they said, hey, great job. You hit a home run, man. They said everything's booked until uh, Super Card of Honor or whatever, WrestleMania weekend, but We'll get you in the mix after that. Let's see what we can come up with, whatever. And uh, then I didn't hear anything for a few months and went back to Columbus, the house show they just had there in February. And Hunter said, dude, TV in April, you're booked. Here's your opportunity. And then I went and did that. And now again, it's kind of a, we're going to call you back again kind of thing. And But everything went well with that. They liked it. They got a great reaction as far as a lot of the feedback that they got online from it. So like, but to get to that opportunity, I went Cleveland to Columbus, to Pittsburgh, or to uh, Philadelphia, then drove to Pittsburgh, to Lockport, back to Cleveland, to go to Columbus, to remind them I'm alive, to get booked in Baltimore, Maryland, to come back and end up on TV. So uh, do the drives is not just a catchphrase. You have to go out there and do it. And that's what I mean when I said I changed my mindset too. You get 10, 12, 15 years in the business you only you start getting in that mindset, and I know I did, and I know a lot of other guys do too, where I'm not going anywhere unless I'm booked, unless I'm paid, and blah, 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 all that stuff. You don't go hang out at shows for the most part anymore. You don't do all the things you did early because now, because there's reasons for that too. There's business reasons why some guys don't like to be seen at shows unless they're booked there. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it, but not doing those things is also the reason why, you know, some guys start to struggle and get better. So kind of having that fresh start opened my mind up to that because it took me a couple thousand miles to get that opportunity. But here's the backside of that that made it even more worth it. As soon as that match aired on television, the next day I got an email from WWE booking me for a series of events there because uh, the people that do that saw the match on TV from Ring of Honor and apparently in the office if you show up on tv and ring of honor they're at least going to take a look at you and see why so it, it, it's kind of funny because we were just uh just we were just recording uh this week's well, i guess last week's at this point's interview with jake garrett and he was talking about how uh you know he's trying to go through uh the local house of hardcore and you got that ecw look because wcw wwe was looking ring of honor is kind of in that that position right now yeah absolutely and so, I mean, it's it's insane. Like, they have the website there with WWE where you send them, your, you upload your information or whatever. And the day, literally that match, I sent it to them on a Thursday. And on a Friday, it was, uh, it was they, I got the email saying, we'd like to book you for the three events and et cetera and so forth. And that was a whole nother, that was just last week. That was a whole nother series of, uh, of, incredible incredible little mini adventures rolled up in there and there's a lot of good things that came out of that like most definitely some stuff i can't talk about but it's some really cool stuff and plus here's i've been doing this 20 years 19 years now in uh in the month of august and i literally am that guy i don't care if i'm extra i don't care i, I stay out of the way but i i literally go around and talk to everybody everywhere i talk to the seamstresses about how they make the gear because i make my own gear in-house i talk to the production people i talk to the people setting stuff up i'm 
I, I used it as an opportunity not just to be seen, but to learn as many things as I could about how the biggest company in the world brings that massive thing every week to a different place and sets it up, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, you, you talked about the road, uh, but I think it's also uh, uh, fair to point out, you know, again, 19 year career, but you're still taking uh, critiques, you know, um, you could, oh my goodness, like, yeah. so, so many at this point could be like, well, this is the way I do it. And, and it's worked for me so far, you go, whether they made it to somewhere or not. And I think that that's really, you know, always be learning, always be growing and evolving is, is a big thing. Uh, we have a couple of comments, uh, from the chat room that I definitely want to touch on here real quick. Uh, they're, they're really kind of turning out for here, uh, yeah. for, for tonight's show. Uh, but I had one question, hold on, I marked a couple of them here. Oh, it took away all my marks. Uh, <laughs> J-Rock. This is from Tragar. It's a little bit of a fun one for you. Have, have, have you ever just entered a room and telling a girl, give it up one time, ever worked as a pickup line? I think he's asking for, for his own use in the future. I promise you there's more than one reason why that became my catchphrase. <laughs> and I promise you that it is quite successful. All right. All right. Maybe the tell-all book later on in life, right? <laughs> No, 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 no. Um, there you go. Uh, so, somebody's asking if you, they sent you a match. Would you be able to watch it? Um, oh, I tell guys that all the time. I have. I, there's probably a couple good two dozen or so uh, regular rotation of guys out there that do that. I tell guys all the time. Even a referee or two will send me their stuff. Anybody that wants to can send me their stuff, and I'll check it out. I can't promise I'll check it out like that day, but I will definitely check it out. The only thing I tell them is, man. I'm super hard on my own matches. So you can't ask me to watch your matches and then get mad at what I tell you because I'm super hard on my own matches. So I'm probably going to tell you some stuff you don't want to hear, but most guys are really receptive. But the thing that drives me the craziest, and you can always tell when a guy is not truly meaning the respect that he's saying, if they, if the first word out of their mouth is explaining some stuff to you. When you say something to them, that is a bad sign that they're not truly wanting to hear what you got to say. And so usually at that point, I just start going, yeah, no, you're right, man. Yeah. But if you want it, heck yeah, send me some stuff and I will definitely check it out. Um, I do it for a lot of guys. Awesome. And obviously you just uh, uh, did some stuff with IWC, you know, being a home promotion for, for a good while for you. Uh, uh, Traegar is also asking, what current IWC champion would you like to take on? I don't know if you're you're uh, up on who's uh, champion. Oh, I, over I know who's days. got what. I know <laughs> okay. who's got what. I got this. I got this. Matter of fact, boy, Justin Plummer's out there. He can go ahead and take a listen to this now, too, because I'm telling you, uh, it doesn't matter. Somebody's going to figure it out, whether it's Delirious, whether it's Justin Plummer, whether it's somebody higher on the food chain than both of them. But the biggest money feud that hasn't happened yet in pro wrestling is Adam Cole, baby, against J-Rock Daddy, because he stole his stick from me, baby. I am the master. I am J-Rock Daddy, and I will gladly. I've never been the super indie champion anytime Justin Plummer wants to make that happen. Matter of fact, the only open Saturday I have all summer long until November is that one that IWC is running uh, in the month of July, and Mr. Cole just happens to be there. But yep. uh, besides that, I'm, you, you asked me that question. That's the only reason I said that. But actually, Justin Plummer and I have talked, and there's definitely uh, going to be at least a show or two here and there while I will still pop up That's for good. them. It's good. Daniel in here is saying that your uh, speech at 16 was, uh, was killer. Uh, Appreciate so. it. Uh, and, uh, there was another one, uh, I think Traegar wanted to know what, oh no, Billy actually wanted to know, uh, your favorite match uh, and or promotion. You mean like of mine? Or yeah, anybody's? yeah, I think so. Oh, I gotta tell you that match I had with, uh, Jason Gorey last month was, was pretty dope at RWA. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think you saw my, my commentary as I was editing that last month. Uh, it was just like, Oh, this, uh, this is, this is good. This is, everybody should check this out guys. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's one of those like where I'm, and that's what I mean. It just seems like, and I, I don't mean this in a bragging kind of way, but every time, every, every match I have, like I go, man, that was all right, man. And then the next one is, it's better, man. Like I just, it's, it's a roll. It's like a snowball rolling downhill. And like, I even, this is going to sound crazy, but I had, like, and this is a lesson for younger guys. I changed my goals. When I came back at first, I found myself getting frustrated again about a year, a year and a half in for the same reasons I was getting frustrated the first time around um, because I had the wrong goals. You can't set goals that cannot be controlled by yourself. And 
uh, regardless of how good or, or talented or whatever you think you are or are not or where you think you could fit in on television, you don't control that. You can be the greatest wrestler in the world and still you don't control whether somebody wants to sign you and put you on TV or whatever. And so that kind of a goal was leading me to frustration because my goal was to, you know, hit the hit the jackpot at the end of the rainbow or whatever you want to look at it. So plain and simply, I changed it. And for the last year, my goal is and will continue to just be become the best wrestler in the world, bar none. And I just my goal is every match to be better than the one before. Everything I do, every time out, to be better, to be in better shape, to look better, work better, be better every single time. We'll wrap it up here. Uh, so what are you watching these days that's kind of got your attention? Um, anybody, a, a, any wrestlers that have gotten your attention or any specific promotion or, or show uh, that you're kind of keeping an eye on for uh, inspiration or just just entertaining you these days? What do you mean? Like, uh, oh, well, I mean, I watch a ton of everything. Like, mm -hmm. I, I definitely like to catch. I, I just don't watch anything when it happens. Like, I'm a. I'm a binge watcher. I'm super busy all the time. So it, it, I've got the fire stick and it may be a few weeks, but then I'll watch what I find, whatever I want. I love mm -hmm. to watch some good new Japan. I mean, some of that's just the best shit oh, out insane, there. Man. Insane. Like, I mean, that, that dominion the, the other day. I mean, just Ray Rowe. I love watching Ray Rowe work. I just love it. Not just cause he's my best friend. I'm, I just told him the other day and I'll tell anybody, I think Ray Rowe, has become one of the best wrestlers in the world at doing the big things and the little things, man. I'm telling you. And Ray, as soon as Ray gets put on an even bigger platform than he's on right now, Ray Rowe is going to be one of the biggest stars in the world. I'm telling you. Absolutely. Great to see him. Um, but ahead. yeah, all that stuff. Ring of Honor's got fun stuff going on. I mean... You know, Lucha NXT is fun. Lucha Underground is whatever, but it's better than it was. It's not what it – well, what it was at first drove me crazy. But they they have some good stuff. And I like to watch good Ricochet stuff, man. Oh, um, yeah. Even though, again, I – see, I appreciate the athleticism because I'm a worker and stuff. But, I mean, obviously, I have my problems with the style too. But, man, I just watch him and I go, man. You just take the things that he does best and just cut them down just a little bit and put him on any TV show anywhere, and he could be one of the biggest stars in the world because what he does is dope. If you think he does too much of it or, or whatever, that's fine, but just fine. Pick whichever parts of it you want, cut the rest out, and he's still dope. Absolutely. Uh, so know? what is the best and the worst thing about your, uh, let's just call it your comeback tour so far? Oh man, the best thing I don't, I, the best thing is, is literally doing it. I'm not kidding. It's become a joke, but every time, wherever I'm going, whoever I'm in the car with, I'll just look at them and I'll just say, where else would you rather be on this Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon, whatever the hell it is, than right here doing this. And I don't mean it to sound like a Tracy Smothers promo, like, but seriously, I appreciate this. Like I love, you can probably hear the passion in my voice. Uh, um, Matter of fact, one of the people that took a liking to me in WWE this last time out was because of my passion for the business because I do have that. And and I have it so much even more this time after just going away for a couple of years and then coming back, man. I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm not able to do this. And I mean, I have an ego. I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm not able to do this good because I have I am having so much fun right now. Like I, I'm booking, I book as many double shots in the same night as I can now because like I, I get off on going to one show and trying to have the best match there and then getting in my car and driving two hours and doing it again on the same night. You know, um, I am truly enjoying the hell out of this business. I'm trying to wrestle as many places and do as much as I can, not just for the social climbing, climbing status and, and the financial stuff, but because I'm enjoying the hell out of just being in and, and all the people I've never wrestled and just getting in here with new people and stuff. That's one of the things I look forward to if I get up there and do some stuff with IWC is working with some people I've never worked with before. There's nothing better than getting in there with some people some kids and just tearing it up and going, Oh man, I just met this dude five minutes ago, you know? Absolutely. Uh, j -Rock, it's been awesome catching up with you and, uh, everything going on with you. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming back on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Where can people find you online? Oh man. Well, I'm on Facebook, Jerry Myers, M I R E S. Um, you'll know it's me. Picture shows you right there who it is. Uh, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram at J rock daddy. Um, pretty easy to remember. That's about it, man. 
All right. Thanks a lot. Check him out. And again, uh, check out his recent stuff, uh, Renegade Wrestling Alliance, IWC. Look up uh, J-Rock, and you'll find a lot of uh, back catalog there on IndieWrestling.us. Uh, please check out all the rest of the interviews and subscribe to the show uh, for Indie Mayhem Show over at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Uh, thank you so much, J-Rock. Thank you, uh, everybody out there in the listening audience. And we'll see you guys next time. Until next time, support Indie Wrestling. Oh. Sick, 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 you know how I act now If you got a problem, come and see if I'm a back down Act wild, steady sipping check This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com